Most legislation and policy governing scientific animal use internationally is based on the utilitarian principle in which the likely human benefits are weighed up against the harms that the animals are expected to uh, experience. There are many cases in which the outcomes in animals match those of human patients, but there are also other cases in which the outcomes differ. For example, many famous and essential medicines such as penicillin, morphine and aspirin actually cause serious side effects and death in some laboratory animal species. Many claims have been made about the importance of animal research in advancing human health care, but usually on the basis of anecdotes or unsubstantiated claims. Systematic reviews are considered to provide gold standard evidence about a wide variety of clinical and research questions. They aim to ensure that no important pieces of published evidence are missed by looking at multiple scientific literature databases. They assess the quality of the evidence retrieved. They have transparent inclusion and exclusion criteria. And they pull the resultant evidence to formulate overall conclusions. Most systematic reviews have clearly indicated that animal research is not normally predictive of human outcomes and only rarely makes substantial contributions to human healthcare advancements, if at all. Animal experiments seem to be unreliable in predicting the most important toxicities of public health concern, that is carcinogenicity, the propensity to cause cancer, and teratogenicity, the propensity to cause birth defects. Animal experiments are generally very sensitive to human toxins, but they're very poorly specific, so they also identify as toxic a large number of compounds that are not actually toxic. So why are animal models so poorly predictive for human beings? Well, it's because the animals are different to humans and also because of the way in which we use the animals. Firstly, animals differ with respect to the degree to which they take up foreign compounds, they distribute them around the body, they metabolize them into other compounds and the ways in which they excrete them from the body. Secondly, the animals that we test on tend to be uh, inbred strains, single sexes, young animals, and quite often inadequate sample sizes. They certainly lack the concurrent illnesses that real human patients will often have, things like uh, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disorders, and lifestyle risk factors such as smoking. Next, we take these animals which are already different from those of human beings and we distort them further by subjecting them to stressful procedures and stressful environments. Most laboratory animals spend most of their lives in relatively small, standardised, barren laboratory cages. They tend to have adverse impacts on their neurological functioning, uh, adverse effects on things like memory and cognition, the processing of information, uh, their neurological architecture tends to decrease in thickness and weight. A variety of behavioural abnormalities can occur as well, such as stereotypies, these repetitive, apparently purposeless behavioural patterns. Most common laboratory species suffer marked stress, quite probably fear and distress as well, when subjected to routine laboratory procedures such as handling, such as blood sampling, and even gavaging. Gavaging is the insertion of a tube into the throat for the forced administration of a test compound orally. All of the stress that these animals experience tends to elevate their levels of stress hormones in the bloodstream, and over a period of time this tends to decrease the competence of the immune system, which is likely to alter the uh, susceptibility of these animals to diseases. In order to maximise the sensitivity of toxicity tests to toxins, in laboratories they tend to be given to animals at very, very high doses, sometimes maximal tolerated doses. The trouble with giving such high doses is that they tend to overwhelm the body's mechanisms that would enable it to deal with these compounds at environmentally realistic doses. And these are things like the induction of enzymes that will detoxify compounds inside the body, the shedding of the epithelium of the skin or the lining of the gut, and also DNA and tissue repair mechanisms. And the result is that many compounds that are not actually toxic at environmentally realistic doses become apparently toxic in these animal studies. 
Finally, many of the systematic reviews have indicated that the majority of animal research does not actually conform to uh, standards necessary to ensure good scientific research. Common deficiencies include lack of sample size calculations, randomization during the allocation of animals to different treatment groups and control groups, and blinding during the assessment of outcomes. Sometimes it's very clear to look at some test data and see whether or not there is an effect. For example, an x-ray showing a broken bone is sometimes very clear. However, other times it's much more difficult to determine whether there has been an effect, for example, of a test drug. And a common example would be to look at something like a tissue slice of part of the brain of an animal that's been exposed to a test drug and try to work out exactly how much tissue has been affected. Research has indicated that unconscious bias is likely to exert the strongest effects when people are measuring subjective rather than objective variables, when they have preconceived ideas about what they expect the result to be, and also when uh, they have an incentive to um, achieve certain research results. And this is why it's so important that assessors are blinded to the subjects that they are assessing. Uh, they should not know whether the subjects have been treated or whether they're control subjects that haven't received any treatment. We know from experiments in the field of human emergency medicine when patients are given a test treatment that if there is no blinding uh, of the assessors and there's no randomization of treatment allocation, then those experiments are much more likely to report a treatment effect, and the treatment effect reported is likely to be larger. Within the field of human research, recognition of these sources of unconscious bias and the adverse impacts they have on research has resulted in the publication of guidelines that experiments need to comply with to ensure good scientific quality and these have been accepted. Within the field of animal research, there have been similar guidelines, and the most common guidelines are the ARRIVE guidelines. And these have been endorsed by more than a thousand scientific journals, funding agencies, and other scientific organizations. The trouble is that despite this widespread endorsement, follow-up studies have indicated that compliance with these guidelines by animal researchers remains quite poor. Even if all these problems were corrected and animal research was conducted to good scientific standards, one final problem would remain, and that's the problem of publication bias. This refers to the well-known phenomenon that experiments indicating that a test drug has some kind of effect on an animal are considered to be more interesting by journal editors than those that demonstrate no effect. Accordingly, they're much more likely to be published. So in the worst case scenario, if you repeat an experiment, say, 20 times, and in 19 out of 20 times you accurately demonstrate that there is no effect, but one time in 20 because of random biological variation, an apparent effect is visible, in the worst case scenario, that one study will be the one that's published. The 19 studies won't be published. In the field of stroke treatment, there have been a very large number of agents which have proven effective in treating animal models of stroke, and almost none of them have gone on to be useful in human patients. Studying this field, it's become apparent that the average effect sizes of these agents has been inflated by about one third, and many thousands of animal lives have been consumed in experiments that have not been published because they've shown no effect of test drugs. And so we've wrongly concluded that many of these agents uh, might be effective and gone on to try them in human patients, where, surprise, surprise, they've been shown not to work. So when considering the harms and benefits of animal research overall, it's not possible to conclude that the benefits to human patients or consumers or to those motivated by scientific curiosity or profit exceed the really substantial harms that are frequently experienced by the millions of animals used in this field. It's only possible to draw such a conclusion that this research is ethically justified if you presume that very minor or infrequent human benefits justify the serious harms experienced by the animals that are used.